are you, brother? Morning, Chris. How are you doing? Doing phenomenal, mate. I was thinking of a, I need to come up with a new word because phenomenal isn't isn't good enough now. I'm gonna oh, say. Right. I was thinking for for mega nominal. Is that a word? Do it. <laughs> Go for it. Just just make it up. Brand it, mate. That that can be yours. Well, for mega nominal. I like that. No, I like it. For mega nominal. <laughs> Don't they say if a word appears in the media more than three times, then it goes in the English dictionary? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Hashtag for that's what you need to do. For Meganominal. For Meganominal. Go. Right, I'm just going to say some key words here, because apparently YouTube, um, they pick up on the first things you talk about. So we're going to say Royal Marines, Afghanistan, Bodyguard, Life coach. It's it doesn't really bother me, but I thought I'd just give it a go and see see if we get a higher <laughs> a higher rating on YouTube. Yeah, why not? So how's life with you, mate? Life's good, mate. Life's good. Quite interestingly enough, obviously we're in the COVID nineteen lockdown terms at the moment in the current climate, and uh, I find myself quite enjoying it. Actually, to be perfectly honest, it's it's something that. I usually live a very busy and, and sort of here, there and everywhere life, which I, I, I thoroughly enjoy. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 cho I choose it. I, I love it. Being in the same place, usually I get bored. But this time around, being forced to be locked down, like I was in Berlin and we got flown home a few days before the lockdown. And I'm really quite enjoying sort of going back to the simple basic stuff of just being at home on your own, sort of working on yourself, really, which is, yeah, I'm really quite enjoying it. Yeah, it's interesting because we, when we chatted the other day, it, I tell you what, mate, it's really refreshing. I've spoken to several bootnecks. That's Royal Marines for, for, our, for our friends at home. Um, and I just love the way there's a divide, right? There's a divide. You've got people on this side of the divide that they don't give a you know what about this whole thing. It doesn't bother. They're secure in their own mind. They know where their life's going. They don't believe what they see in the media anyway. And it's like jobs are good on, you know, just just be happy, make the most of the time off. Um, and then, of course, you get the other side of the line. And, and I'm going to be up. Well, I'm going to be my honest here and say I think it's because it's people that believe what they see in the media all the time. They believe all the scare stories and that, you know, we're all going to die in our beds. And, and I just want to say how much more rewarding and pleasant it is talking to somebody like yourself that, that um, just has this like, yeah, Life's as good as ever, <laughs> you know. Vicey, Paul Vice, you know, I, he, he said, um, the apocalypse is treating me well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I fully, yeah, I, I absolutely concur. And, and sort of to, to, to elaborate on what you just said there, it's, I'm exactly the same. I know some people that, um, sort of friends that, that I grew up with and things like that, and they're, they, they don't get out of their dressing gown for three days. They don't know what the time is. They don't know what day it is. And they're waiting for whatever normality or normal life was before all this happened. And for me, that's just a waste because this is an unknown period of time that you're going to be stuck at home. Utilize the time. For me, efficiency it comes priority in most things that I do. If there's a better way of doing something, I want to know. And essentially, with a, a sort of a, a growth mindset that I've learned to cultivate over the years is if you're if you're the same person you was yesterday or last week or last month, you're, you're either growing or you're dying is my sort of philosophy. So why would you just want to sit and tread water and just sort of wait around like I'm just like, right, I've got 24 hours for me, like 100 percent, not running around after anybody else. What can I do? So like your morning routine and all the rest of that stuff, getting dressed. Like people are like of two issues. I'm like, keep things going and plow through and work, 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 work. 
And other people are like, yeah, but I don't need to get up. So why should I? Why should I get dressed? Why do I have a shower? Like, it's just a different sort of train of thought. It's one of those, when you talk about sort of levels of consciousness and you, and you, you look at sort of unconsciousness and people, you don't know what you don't know, right? So some people, I say this in the loosest term possible, but it's not their fault because they genuinely are not aware of the bigger picture of growing and, and all the rest of that type of thing and just becoming a bit be better person and personal development and all that sort of stuff. But for someone that's, that knows that, it's so hard to just sit around and do nothing and just wander and waste, waste the days and waste the time. Yeah, there's so many factors in there that we could pick to pieces. Um, I, I've been learning, I've learned a massive amount from a chap on YouTube called John St. Julian, a really nice guy, Geordie lad, or he's, anyway, he's from somewhere that, north of Exeter, so that's like Geordie to me, right, <laughs> <laughs> down here in the south. But he talks a lot about uh, scripture, not, not a hasten to have from a religious perspective, he's not like a pushing the Bible on, right? He's talking about the wonderful um, lessons that are there that have been written for thousands upon thousands of years by, by wise men over the ages, which when you learn to interpret them, all come out to the same message, which is what us as life coaches speak today. One of them is about, um, he talks about when the Adam and Eve, and obviously we're talking um, God, the word slips my mind, Me metaphorically now or, or symbolically, but when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden and they decided to go east of Eden, that's, that's a metaphor for in your brain when you move from your, let me get this right, when you move from your left brain, which is your control brain, which is what the the powers that be, you can say, focus in to control us. You move from that conditioning brain across to your right side of your brain, the right hemisphere, where you start to um, develop your thinking skills, you develop your artistic side, you develop your empathy, you develop your creativity. Basically, you're, it's your independent self, right? I mean, you need obviously both sides of your brain. So that in the Bible, when they say Adam and Eve went east of Eden, that that's what it's saying is they, you know, they took the forbidden fruit, which was the do you want to stay as a sort of non thinking animal or do you want to start questioning life? Right. And I wonder if that relates to our situation now where you get people that have only ever used their left brain. They've been told when to go to school, when to go to work, what time they clock off what time EastEnders comes on, what time they're allowed to open a bottle of wine, you know, what time the kids get up in the morning, what, and, and that's, if, if that's all you know, lockdown is a completely different experience for you, right? Because your structure, i.e. going to, it's been taken away, and suddenly it's like, hey, you've got all this free time, now, to me and you, it's like, no, I haven't got enough free time. I, I want to do this. I want to plan this. I want to talk to this person. I, I've got this part of my business I'm trying to develop. I can be speaking. I've got Zoom. I've got Skype, social media. I can be doing. It's like we haven't got enough time, right? Because we found a passion in our lives and we love what we do. And, and uh, yeah, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that curiosity. It's, it's that being curious on any successful person. It's, I believe they're they're ridiculously curious. They're always wanting to know the next thing or find out what's going on or why is that happening? Or, Oh, teach me that, teach me that Make, sort of maintaining a, a white belt mentality, as I like to call it, what I've heard in the past. And I think it's great. It's like, just be that sponge, just like, Oh, I don't know about that. So let's dive into it. Like, let's just get amongst it and just find out what is actually going on in 
in here because the amount of people that don't understand why they do certain things or why they want to do certain things or what they want to do the amount of people that kill themselves for a job that they hate just for a paycheck to tread water along and just live for the weekend and go out on the on a on a friday and saturday night is it, it, it's yeah I, I can't quite fathom it for some people really mm, yes so let's let's talk about you jack jack english i love that name it's probably one of the coolest names you, you can have isn't it <laughs> get, i want to give a shout out now to my buddy james english um who's scottish um oh that it doesn't quite fit when it's a different <laughs> i bet he's had that all his life but i'll tell you what 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 a nice man if anyone's not watched um james english's podcast just just get on youtube type in james english and just just one of the uh one of the lovely things about my life is that I've got people like that in it, you know, or I've, I've at least had the chance to interact and with, with unassuming, non-judgmental, open people that are all on this journey that, that, that we're on for whatever. I don't know if that's the right brain thing that we want to go on this journey and, and, and not just stay stagnant and like waiting to react and waiting to be told what to do we're flowing and it's and it's great so james i love you brother thank you uh thank you very much but yeah jack english it i, I said to my little boy this morning i was like, i'm talking to jack english not johnny english jack english <laughs> he was just laughing his head off obviously <laughs> we're big johnny english fans yeah i get it all wrong. and my dad's name's john as well so you can imagine the, the <laughs> flat he got in that game. <laughs> So let's let's talk about you, mate, and not 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 the uh, universe. Um, you seem like a really balanced person, and I've made the mistake. I've got a lovely friend called Steve, Steve Selman, if he's looking. And I I said to Steve one day because we're in training together. I said, Steve, you come across as the archetypal, like, well brought up kid. I bet you had a mummy that loved you and a daddy that like kicked a football around with you. And I bet you did, you, you know, they helped you to do your homework. He turned around and he went, Chris, I was adopted. I never knew my mum and dad. I'm like, how we make these judgments that can be so, you know, he, Steve is like the coolest guy I know. He's such a, he's just a lovely guy to be around right he's just he smashes he smashes every day he gets up early he's still going at night and he loves what he, what what he does right and so i was so wrong there so how do you put yourself on the kind of childhood to joining the marines sort of you know scale uh, quite well actually i'd say like i was very fortunate i've got I've got great parents there sort of growing up. I was very well brought up. Um, we never really working middle class. We never sort of had loads of money or, or, or anything. We never really wanted for anything, which was great. Um, <clears throat> but we also weren't spoiled and we knew the value of money and, and bits and bobs like that. So yeah, well, I, I was brought up properly in that regard. Um, absolutely. Um, I was basically one of the kids at school at the time where sort of everyone's mum and dad were just getting divorced all the time. They're all split up. Everyone, anyone's house I went round to, it was like, oh, their dad's house or their mum's house. And it was like, oh, John and Sue are the ones that are always watching the football match or the rugby match, both there together. Like sometimes just mum and dad on their own of the whole 25 lads on a, on a, on a playing field. And there's just raining, pissing with rain. And it's just my mum and dad watching, which... It is a testament to them. Um, subsequently, later on in life, they're, they're now separated um, a few years back. But yeah, as a kid growing up, was was absolutely great. There's um, yeah, are they um, um, are they separated because they went. You bloody made me go and watch rugby in the rain. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but yeah, sort of growing up. Yeah, it was, was great, which was sort of a, a quite a funny story, actually, because when I left school and then 
started in the building construction trade and things like that. I got pr pretty much everyone at school left, left school and, and did a, a building trade. And I started doing some other bits and bobs and bricklaying and construction and all this, that and the other. And uh, I was just looking around one day on the building site and I was just like, saw some of the guys that were 50, 55, 60 years old. And I was just like, I had a sort of epiphany moment where I was like, that is not going to be me. I, I no way like doing the same thing I was doing now as a 16, 17 year old lad. And I was just like my whole 40 year life just flashed before my eyes. And I saw myself with a big beard and ass hanging out your trousers. And I was just like, absolutely not. That is not going to be me. And uh, I remembered back to the military coming and doing talks at school and stuff and uh, nothing in particular. None of my family were ex-military or anything like that. Um, and I went to the careers office, snuck out on, took the day off work, snuck to the careers office, didn't tell a soul and uh, went down and, and uh, this this sort of this naval officer took me into the office and we sort of had a bit of a chat and a characterization interview as they as they call it where they sort of get a feel for who you are and some you up and blah 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 and sort of two hours went by and uh after a while he sort of slides this pamphlet across the table at me at, at the royal marines and he was like have you ever thought of the royal marines and i was like pretty hardcore I don't, I don't know not really i don't know anything about them or anything like that i just know marines are pretty tough and uh me being the curious young sort of teenager that I was, was when he said the words that it's the longest and hardest arduous basic military training in the world, I was like, challenge. I was like, I feel a bit lost at the moment. I don't really know what I'm doing, where I'm at, what I want to be doing. I don't know what I want to do. But this sounds like a good opportunity and a good challenge. It's going to be hard. I grew up playing sport to a to a, a good level my whole sort of childhood, so I was fit anyway and naturally sort of loved it, running around and fitness and all the rest of that type of stuff. So I was like, yeah, let's have a go at that. So went through all the different procedures, interviews, tests, and, and written test and numeracy and all that sort of stuff, and then another interview, and then got accepted, and then. They were like, right, we need you to come down and do a little fitness test. So I dropped, went down and did a fitness test on a on a treadmill and some pull-ups and stuff and passed that. And then they were like, right, okay, we'd, we'd like to offer you a place to come down on the potential Royal Marines course, which is a four or five day test of everything. Basically, you go down to the commando training center and you just live there for five days and you get tested every day on basically everything. And... <clears throat> I was sat upstairs in my bedroom one evening and my dad, because I'm Jack English and my dad's John English, the letter was addressed to Mr. J English. So my dad opens it and it's obviously, it's, we've invited you to Commando Training Centre, Limpston, blah, blah, blah. And my dad comes upstairs, I'm playing on the computer or whatever I'm doing. And uh, he's like, son, son, I'm, I'm joining the Royal Marines. He was like, either I've had a call up or you've applied to join the marines so it was like i was like uh yeah i bet i suppose we better have a chat so goes downstairs as sits down and, and chats with mum and dad and yeah basically there were tears mum was like oh my god what's going on no 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 but then after sort of 10 minutes of actually thinking about it it was like well okay so is this something you've like what's the talk to me sort of thing what's the sketch and i was like look it's nothing like it, I ha it's not a, a thing that I've wanted to do. Like they knew me. They were like, you've never expressed an interest in this. And uh, once they found out and I explained about the, I don't want to be on the building site for the rest of my life, blah, blah, blah. They were fully behind me and had the both support of both of them. Um, and then I went down, I went down on the five day course, passed the course and started training the, it was like one of the quickest turnarounds I think they, they do. Like I literally finished on the Friday and I think I had a week at home to get my stuff sorted and then started training like the following week. It was like less than two weeks from finishing PRMC on the Friday to starting on the following Sunday or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, it was one of those sort of never look back sort of story really. Went down there, 
within the first couple of weeks, it was it was a real struggle for my mum and dad. I think they really sort of not that they expressed it to me, but later on they sort of highlighted that it was hard and all the rest of that type of stuff. And they do a really good thing in the Marines where in at like week three or four, they bring the families down and they have a day where they show them everything. And that really set my mum's, my mum, mainly my mum's, but my mum and dad's mind at ease and stuff. And saw where I was, saw who I was with. Yes, they weren't treating me very well, but she could see the environment in which I was being characterization, I suppose. It's character building is, is what they like to determine it. Um, but, yeah, after that, it sort of set their mind at ease and they supported me throughout. They've supported me up to this day, really, in anything that I've pursued, which is, is a testament to them, which is, which is great. What year did you rock up to Limpston then for your, tra- for your commander training? 2006, I started. Was that hard, um, arriving there and realising that a fucking legend called Chris Thrall had like already been through before you or, or did you just yeah I mean, just just getting off the train there were echoes around the streets and the war halls of just uh, it was just yeah it was just one of those things <laughs> Chris Thrall who struggled with the endurance course and who did his swimming test about three times <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yes it, it this is the dilemma you know i'm quite sort of up on on it's all a bit i i I don't want to say u.s policy because i'm not putting americans in bad light because it's not the american people that create the policy and it's not even the american politicians that create the policy it's these fucking psychopaths above uh, that that play everybody right but so I, I'm always honest with people, you know, about what war is, who who stands to gain from, from a lot of these conflicts. But that doesn't take away from the fact that, that, that this is this is the why they've got us, is that joining the Marines is it's such a special thing. You know, just listening to you now, all the feelings coming back of that, the letter and the, you know, your parents are like, what? You got in. You got in, you know, because nobody believes you can do it. And you go, yeah, I, 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 I did it. I, I did it. Not not somebody else. I, I did it. I got myself in and I'm going to get myself through it. You know, it's really it's quite hard for me because it's certainly something that helped shape my life absolutely i'm not saying that that in any way everybody has to do that to shape their life there's probably far better ways it's but it's just that this one is gosh it's it's freaking i so much wish there was a like a limston commando that anybody could go to but you just didn't have to go to war afterwards you know just to learn those skills those values camaraderie or it wasn't always camaraderie sometimes you you freaking hated people right but <laughs> yeah. you know, what i'm saying is it's not it's not all glory and certainly being in a commander unit is that's about 20 percent glory and about 80 percent boredom which is why a lot of forward thinking kind of mo sounds a bit rude to long-term career guys i'm i'm not i'm not knocking anybody here i'm just saying i did my seven years and after about four i thought it's kind of time to move on you know i'm there's 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 other stuff out there that i want to do and i've done the norway i've done the the, i've been in combat or i've been in northern ireland at least um been up there in snow uh, skiing with a huge backpack on in, in in arctic warfare training in norway like yeah i could do all that again but that's when it becomes like the job. Whereas for me, and I think a lot of people, I was more for like the experience. Um, yeah, interest, interesting. My gosh. So did you struggle at all in training? Do you remember any kind of pertinent points? Um, yeah, I mean, 
it's never easy. You said about there's got to be an e- it's got to be a, a better way. There's definitely an easier way than going and down to the limbs them for sure. Um, it's thirty two weeks, nine months of of pure unadulterated hard work. Um, but yeah, that's that's the the basis key fundamentals that that have built me into the person that I am now. The discipline and the the sort of sense of attention to detail and all the rest of that type of stuff which i carry around in my everyday life every single day getting up out of bed at, at 5 36 in the morning making my bed straight away and then going for a run is i do that now on autopilot without even thinking about it um which is such a good and i can't stress enough how much of a good set of habits they are to have for anybody like talking before about people that are struggling getting out of bed and no structure to their life. That's that, that what, the, what Limpston installed into me it, is something I'll carry for the rest of my life. And what something I will instill into my kids, whether they go want to join the military or not, it makes no odds because my personal preference in life is that that is a great attribute to have to human performance, let alone going to war or anything like that. Yes, you don't need to be shouted at in the face and all the rest of the stuff and screaming and pull-ups and push-ups and all the rest of that to an extent. But having the self-discipline and the self-sort of awareness of what it is that you want to and need to achieve on a daily basis, I think is fundamental. It's, it's, it's so interesting you say that because like, I won't get out of bed without pulling the duvet over, making sure it's nice and nice and squared away and... It, it it's just to me there isn't another way to live it's not because i'm brainwashed it's nothing to do with brainwashing it's because no, for me it just makes you feel so freaking good good you know it makes your day good you start it off right you know i say to you start your day and in the first 20 minutes win a tick something off your list or may have one win you're setting yourself up for a good day there's there's absolutely nothing worse than, I mean, I don't know because I've never had it, but getting into a bed at the, in the evening unmade must be horrendous. I can't fathom it. It's like this, Jack, right? If you get out of bed and you just throw the duvet over and you leave that in a mess and your clothes from the night before are just lying on the floor and, and you know, your bathroom's a mess, but how at, at what point in your day do you become like superman that's going to smash it you, we, you, you you you've already started your day in a bunch of baggage you're not going there's not going to be a point in your day where you go do you know what i'm going to be a focused human being i'm going to focus on my dreams my goals i'm going to support my family i'm going to make sure i become a happy achieving individual and we're not talking about money here friends or or promotions we're talking about paradise inside right you know you get out of bed your pants are there from the night before you don't make the bed because you don't well there isn't going to be a point in the day where you where you do you know what i'm saying jack you know it's start as if you mean to go on I, i i would say Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And for me, it's just the basis of setting yourself up for any sort of success that you want, personal, business, like whatever, like get up and make your bed. It's something that you can win the morning without even thinking about it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Jack, did you have, was one of the commander tests like harder harder than the others for you? Um, this is going to sound really big headed, but not really. They all sort of had equal importance, really, and equal. They were all hard, very, very hard, and obviously they're on consecutive days as well, which makes it even harder. But I think I was sort of by that point, you're so in the zone, um, and you're so well conditioned physically. I think you're at something stupid like the 20 something percent fittest in the UK at that point or something. I remember someone throwing a statistic around, but um, 
there wasn't not one just stuck into my head per, per se probably the endurance course because it was the first test i think because it was like you're at the armory at something sit like four in the morning or something to walk up to woodbury to get there to start i think that was the worst because it was like the anticipation of jesus christ i've just spent eight months working up to this point and now it's here it's like the commando test oh my god once i started it was fine it wasn't fine it was hard work but i think on that initial walk up was the whole sort of the nerves were bubbling the butterflies and all the rest of it once you got once that buzzer went off or the, the pti blew that whistle and it was going it, it it was game time it was it was carry on you were in the zone and then honestly the next the next few tests were like it was almost excitement to wake up i mean excited and, and scared of the you have the same feelings but i framed the first test as fear and excitement and, um, and and sort of anxiety to be like oh my god oh we've talked about this for the whole time and looked up to everyone that's doing them and now i'm the one that's setting off on the endurance course to two parts like this is it now i've got to give everything i've got to get in under this 70 odd minutes or whatever it is to get through and then i've got the three other tests it's not like oh i've done the endurance is in the bag it's like one down three to go and it's like <laughs> yeah so i'd say the endurance was the the most anticipated for me because it was the first one but after that it was like i was in the zone then and it was just like let's go let's go let's go i was sort of i was a fit fit lad and i sort of was did did well i i sort of come top of my bottom field session i i got the quickest round the assault course i come like in the top couple three or four for the endurance course and the and the, and the tarzan assault course so i was like i said I, i'd played sport and was fit my whole life so it was by no means easy but i enjoyed it and i excelled at it so I'd say the hardest part was the anticipation before the first test because it was just like, oh shit. Do you remember that feeling when you come out of Peter's pool? So you're wading up to your neck, you got your rifle above your head. We we did it in February, so we had to smash the ice to get across. And you come out the other side and as you emerge from the water, it hits you that I'm weighing twice as i'm suddenly weighing twice you don't think about that when you when you watch the videos and stuff you don't no. think you can only experience that in the moment you come out and as you gradually come out the water you get heavier and heavier and it doesn't stop <laughs> no. it's almost like a, a sort of snake a boa constrictor is just continually doing that and then the run back to camp is just Oh yeah, it just horrid, horrid. I was um, I was pretty pissed off. I must say in training because I should have got the commando medal, and I and I explain why is I came off the endurance course, and I hidden my bike in the hedge. Right? <laughs> no, 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 wait. You haven't heard that's you haven't heard my challenge, right? And I hopped on it. And I'd set the seat too high. So I had to cycle all the way back to camp with a seat that was about three inches too fucking high, right? And I, I just think my training team should have recognized that and just, you know, I should have got the commando medal for overcoming, <laughs> overcoming adversity. But no, didn't get any. I got PT, PT superior and that was it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I, that's what I got was one of those. So. But yeah, no, it's, yeah, it takes me back now, actually, the feeling of doing that. It's, yeah, pretty awesome. Your unit was? I went left, I passed out, went up to 4-5, um, oh. up in Marbroth, Condor. Yeah. Against my will, it was like number six on the list. Because um, oh, okay. I live in like the Midlands, I was like, oh, not for any other reason, not like, oh, my mates are here, blah, blah, blah. I knew no one in the Marines, like only the people that I was in uh, recruit training with. So for me, it was like, well, I don't know anything. I'd heard tales that four or five were all scary, hard, horrible jocks and 
go to Norway and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I was like, oh, well, 40 is the closest. Let's go there. Let's go 4-2. Let's go 4-5 last, FPG last, because I don't want to go beyond the wire. And uh, lo and behold, there was a shortage at 4-5. So off we went. Uh, pretty much 90% of my troop that passed out ended up going to 4-5, all of us against our will. Um, but which... Th th those sequence of events we all ended up were sort of southerners and we all ended up staying up there being camp or camp orphans and living up there for four years and becoming the tightest group of of sort of close brothers that i still i was best man at all their weddings like we stay in touch i was on facetime them yesterday i'm like uncle to the, the children like it's the world has a funny way of working itself out so yeah went up to four or five um and uh, yeah, was in was in Yankee Company, then Victor Company and Zulu Company, um, and then went on and did my recce selection and went into recce troop, reconnaissance troop. Um, subsequently, went to tour to Afghanistan, two tours as well. One tour of Afghanistan before five. Um, numerous went to Norway each year. Subsequently, became a, an Arctic instructor. So I then taught the guys in Norway, uh, military skiing instructor. Um, all sorts of stuff really I did all my driving qualifications so I had my driving license when I joined um, but I got like my C plus E and lorry and all the rest of that stuff so I could drive the Winnicks and Jackals and all the military vehicles that go with it um, and yeah just had a great time as a young young Marine four years up in up in Scotland never really went home because it was so like eight hour, nine hour drive back to Northampton. Um, and yeah, there was a big group of us that stayed up there. We were the camp orphans. We had a great time. Um, yeah, it was awesome. It was... Yeah, tell, tell me something, right? And I, 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 I reckon a lot of blokes would be fascinated to know this. So four or five are legendary for wearing their berry with the, um, the globe and laurel over their sort of left ear or between their ear and their eye, right? I'm trying, I'm trying to remember how it is. It's like... Yeah, so you, you, uh, 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 a, a drill instructor, the, the, the textbook way to wear your beret is to have your global oil cap badge directly above your left eye. Directly above. Four or five for some silly reason. Well, I don't know if it's a silly reason. I'd heard that essentially in Norway, because the cap badge is metal, when you wore your beret, which is very, very few times in Norway, but I suppose back in the day, they probably didn't have much of a woolly hat. They probably just wore their beret because they were just hard blokes back then. Um, there was a, a, a sort of story that went round that they slid them around to the side onto their hairline so that the badge didn't freeze to their head. So that was where it was apparently originated from. But then it's one of those standards that it just comes up and, and one of the... RSMs at the time, um, mentioning no names, I just remember him sort of turning around and someone asked him that question and I think he, he's a hard to, I'll paraphrase, but it was something along the lines of, it just looks cooler. So my question for you is, at what point on your journey in 4-5 do you adopt that style? Is there like a, you know, you're a sprog, you're not allowed to do it or... or absolutely yeah it's sort of one of those things once you you embed yourself in slowly it it doesn't sort of well i suppose it's, it's slightly cre creeps itself round um but yeah it's sort of one of those things it's the longer you 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 are that sprog you you are offer to do the things you do the shit jobs you take the bins out you do this you clean up you do that blah 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 once you, once you gain that respect, it's the same as getting a, a core tattoo. Um, it's sort of one of those unwritten rules. There's no like, right, now you're, you're accepted to fling your cat badge around to the side or get your tattoo. It's just one of those things where it's like, you know from your peers and you can read the environment that it's like, no, do you know what? For me, it was sort of once we went to Af Afghanistan, so about just shy of 12 months into it once you've been and done some few a few once you'd sort of earned your stripes per se um you were sort of it was okay to because you were in with the peers then once you just sort of took it 
I looked at the other people that wore their berets that way. And I was like, once I was doing stuff and in a shell scrape with someone doing that, I found that it was, I, I built that mutual respect enough to be, okay, we can start to creep it around and blah, blah, blah. And then obviously, yeah, by, by the time you're in Norway, it's like round here anyway, usually. But yeah, it's, it's just something silly along, along the sort of the lines of what they do. But yeah, each little unit has their little ticks and little things that they have. And we always used to, I always, obviously you can see my hair now, I always used to push the boundaries with long hair and I used to have my sleeves lower and it's just, it's just what, what happens. It's just one of those things. It's, some people get a beer in their bonnet. Some people think, oh, you're trying to change the standards, but it's, it's, it's nothing really. It's just sort of trying to be, be comfortable. And as much as it's, the military is regimented and everything is the same and blah, blah, blah. It's for me, it was like something trying to keep some sort of identity for myself. Um, I didn't want to be that cardboard cutout sort of robotic. Yes, I do what you say, blah, blah, blah. The whole thinking soldier and, and forward thinking person. My, my kind of, um, I, I tell you one thing, it was, it was nice to have power of wings. I don't know why, but, Whenever you saw the blokes fall in in free ranks, and say so, so out of thirty blokes, there'd be two or three would have the para wings. And I kind of got mine, all, not by accident. Obviously, you have to do the course, but to get on that course was always perceived as being really hard. It's actually not. It's quite easy. You just phone yeah. up, and say, "Can I come on the course?" Did I you did the same thing. Yeah, exactly did, that. Uh, yeah, you can just phone up and go, "Can I?" And they'll go, "Yeah, come next week." It's but in the yeah. Marines, you think it's really hard. And as such, only like three out of every 20 guys have the power. And that was, it was just nice. You had them above your corporal stripes. And it's like, it's like your Paris, Milan, New York fashion, but within the military kind of um, understanding. Exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. And it's, yeah. What I did though is um, I, my biggest hate with uniform apart from the hairy shirts, which fortunately we got rid of while I was in, was the denims, that's your trousers, that would ride up over your boots. I hated that. Yeah. And it was really simple. You just had to go to the stores and get a longer pair of denims. I know it sounds silly, but they would issue a certain size in training and that would stick in your head that this is my size, but no, you could just go to the stores and say, right, I'm this waist, but I want mine four inches longer. And you'd yeah. get a pair of them. Then you could tuck them in and they would stay snug right around. Almost if that's the, the toe cap of your boot, they'd stay snug just around the top. And you'd never have to spend all day bending down and put adjusting. You've got these like elastic bands that you put around your boot to hold your, your trousers down sort of all to you know keep them hemmed in and and by getting a, a, a just four in, four more inches longer on your denims you never had to do that thing where you you're adjusting them and that used to just look it used to look ugly and it used to just make me think this this is this hasn't been thought out this whole like elastics thing it just it hasn't been thought out <laughs> yes Anyway, Jack, let's talk about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Were you there with 4-5? Yeah, so I did my first tour with 4-5 Commando, and then I did a sec subsequent second tour four year, four, three, four years later, three years later, um, with BPT, which was the Brigade Reconnaissance Force, um, which was a wider array. Um, we had a SBS major as our OC which so we were very very fortunate in terms of doing some really really cool sort of SF type um, strike ops and, and hostage rescues and things like that which was really cool so mm. but yeah the first the first tour was literally groundhog day every day digging in a forward operating base eating rations out of tins like just way to grow up past that training went up went up to four or five shock of capture of living in scotland which turned out to be really really nice i always had this perception that the jocks and and, and scotland itself was a miserable bleak place 
absolutely completely changed my whole perception on that. They're really lovely people and the place is beautiful. Um, hey, let's just give a shout out to Scotland because I tell you what, when they had this referendum recently about independence, uh, I would have... I would have missed Scotland being a part of my, my, what I call, not my country, it's my nation, obviously. But just, I, I didn't want those guys to go. No, no, you know, I didn't want those guys because I've just met such wonderful Scottish people. It goes about saying we're brothers and sisters, especially in the military. And the fact that you're going to have this independent nation, up, it, it was, does it have to be like that? You know, I know the British have been, the English rather, have been a bunch of you know what so, you know, throughout history and probably uh, continue to do so in certain arenas. But it was just like when I when I ran when I ran from John O'Groats to Land's End. Oh, my God, you saw a side of people that you don't really see in England, if I'm honest. It's not that English people aren't wonderful. It's just that Scottish people have still maintained this element of when you meet a stranger, you extend your hospitality to them. And that was all I experienced. It was just amazing. Yeah, great, great place. Um, but yeah, sort of talk about learning to grow up quickly. I was in Afghanistan sort of just after my 18th or 19th birthday. Um, so yeah, sort of spotty teenager running around Lipston and Woodbury Common and then all of a sudden it's like oh we're in the desert in Afghanistan and it's like Jesus now it's time to put everything you've learned into practice in real life we've got live rounds and we've got bullets coming the other way and uh yeah again another key pillar and fundamental core element of who I am today what are those, were those early seven months that I spent in in uh, in Helmand province in, in Afghanistan. It's very different, isn't it? When you go on deployment and you're in that zone and you're literally going out on patrol every X amount of hours, it's not like you're going to get a day off or two days off and you can go and go down a pub and, you know, put your wash in it. No, you don't get, it's a set thing. When you get your time off, it's eat, sleep, clean it or clean sorry clean your weapon mm. get your kit in order eat sleep bang you're back out again there's no no time for this right is my shirt ironed is my stuff no all that stuff stays sweat soaked for six months or whatever mm. because you are you are on on the job and it's it, it's almost like certain rules materialize or, or more from what you've been tra in training. It's like shave every morning, iron your clothes, wash in the, you know, take your shirt off and wash. And no, when you go into war or, or, or conflict, it's, it's different, isn't it? You know, it's different. It is, yeah. And it's, it, but the same principles still apply. It's for me, it's the sort of one of the, the main things I even carry myself now in terms of having left the military five years ago, six years ago, is you need those core basic fundamentals, fundamentals of where you're at because no one rises to any occasion. You just sink to the level that you're trained at or train, or you sink to the level of your training. So the higher standards you set yourself in day to day and in your training, once you actually compete at some sort of level in whatever you're doing, and things start to get real, those bullets start to come the other way. You don't just go, oh no, I know what I need to do. You just autopilot before you know it, you're doing your 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 um, job and it's and you're doing it without thinking about it because you've done it over and over and over and over and over again and you've set yourself the standards or you've had the standards set for you on what it is that you need to achieve at a certain level to be able to progress and, and carry out the job when did it get real for you I'm, I'm assuming you're in a forward operating base you're going out on patrol every day when when did the rounds start coming in and you thought oh this uh, this isn't training anymore ah oh, literally day two i think we 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 ended up getting dropped off um dropped off in the fob we took over from some of the parachute regiment lads 
Um, so we got in there, the paras, and it was literally like we were all fresh faced, clean uh, uniform, and all the rest of it. And it was like they'd just done a summer tour, so they were they were all really tanned, all looked about forty, all just shredded because they weren't like eating properly, but still f- working sh- extremely hard every single day. And uh, we were just like, oh, geez. And they almost sort of laughed at us because it was like, you have no idea what you're getting yourselves in for here. Like, and what we, we, we absolutely found out straight off the bat, what sort of environment we were getting ourselves in, in, into. Um, and we were unfortunate enough that we were in a, a, a base that was completely surrounded by the green zone. So the green zone in Afghanistan is not the desert. It's the ploughed fields and the, the crops that are, that are around. So they constructed the, the, the forward operating base two or three tours before. I think, I think 40 on Herrick 7 may have, have constructed it and built it. Um, and essentially it was just one of, the, one of the main areas throughout the whole tour at the whole sort of battle zone of Helmand where the threat came in in so close um, and we would have literally Taliban fighters within 100 metres of the fog shooting at the at the Sangers and the, the positions that the guys that we would operate uh, we would um, utilise as our sort of viewpoints and all the rest of that type of stuff to, to give ourselves security And literally, I think the first or second patrol we went out on was literally straight into it, rounds coming down. And it was like, initially, I mean, no one, we never ever jested about anything. And it was never like, oh, it's not, it's going to be a walk in the park. We knew that it was, it was tasty and we knew that things were going on. But yeah, nothing really can set you up for those first initial, no one, no, you could be the hardest guy on the planet, best soldier you've ever seen. But nothing is going to prepare you for that first instance of being on a two-way range and the, and the rounds coming down the other side. It, it's it's an almost an out-of-body experience is the best way to describe it. Um, I remember being in a bun line and literally walking along the bun line. And the bun line is basically a built-up sort of defence of the mound of grass along a, a thing. So we're walking in the trench. Our heads are probably just above the bun line and literally next thing you hear the snap and the crack of the other Ryan round coming over the top. So we all hit the deck and I, this was at night. So in the dark and I just remember hitting the deck and turning over because I was, I sort of knew that the bun line was there and I was down here. I sort of turning over and just seeing the, the lit up rounds, the tracer rounds from the other side coming above my head. And it was almost like a star Wars type shit. And it was like, no, you need to wake up. This is real. This is what you're doing. This is what you're here for. And like I said before, the whole not rising to the occasion, sinking to the training, it was like, right, what do I need to do? Step one, what do I need to do? I need to get back. I need to get rounds back out the other way. I need to make sure everyone's okay. Like, it, it's a flurry. Your head is just like... They a, were... Override of information. They're using Tracer. They were, yeah. Fuck, that means they're getting supplied by a military source. Yeah, some of their PKMs and their machine guns and stuff, they are tracer rounds in, so... Probably yeah. getting supplied by the Brits and the Americans, if you ask me. <laughs> you know, long, yeah. Probably, because we sell arms to everybody, as do the, the French, the Swedish. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? it? You know, you think that there's some ragtag group that are getting, scrounging up their weapons from you know the the soviet invasion or something and it's like no actually they're an armed force they're getting yeah. supplied they're buying it from somewhere in bradford or blackburn or somewhere yeah. like where some of the lads are from like you know it's it's the origination but then sort of that whole concoction of information overload in your brain of what do i need to do where do i need to be what needs to happen what are the drills that i need to go through how do i conduct myself to get myself out of here safe Within a couple of weeks, that that initial you hear around, you're just in. The, you go back to that in the zone. It's the same as when I did the first day on the endurance course. It was like, oh my god, oh I'm nervous. What's that? What's this? What what have I got to do? Oh come on, just need to go as fast as I can, as hard as I can. Exactly the same 
first time the rounds come down, it's like, holy shit, this is real. What am I doing? What do I need to do? Two weeks later, you're sort of laughing almost at someone jumping in a ditch and, and one, of the, one of my best mates, with someone, some rounds come overhead and he, he was only a little guy anyway, literally about five foot tall, one of the best soldiers I've ever worked with. And he jumps in this water ditch, this in like trench, and he just see like all you see is his like antenna from his um, day sack sticking out of the thing. And it was like, we, we're in the middle of a firefight. We've got people shooting at us and we're just pissing ourselves laughing because your man's literally almost drowned and we're trying to pull him out. But it just goes to show that sort of, not that we laugh in the face of jest, but once you get, once something becomes normality, you, you, your brain just accepts it and, and just works through it. It's that initial, holy shit, but once you sort of, it's happening day in, day out. We were going out every single day, it's two, three times a day, and we were getting shot at every single day. Mm -hmm. So it just became the norm for us. So the way we worked and the way we did things after that tour made me so much of a better soldier because I was practicing what I preached and I was doing it day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. And before you knew it, you were you were going through your drills and stuff. And remember learning the drills and stuff in the like weapon stances and things and being like, Jesus, how am I going to be able to do all this all so quick and blah, blah, blah. You get to that point where you're doing it without even thinking about it and you're moving, you're talking, doing other things, you're thinking about something else. Again, it comes down to those levels of consciousness of being unconsciously competent where you can do something on autopilot with muscle memory whilst you're thinking and doing something else um and again it's repetition 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 daily habits good training it's and and stuff that is ultimately transitional into into daily life it's not it doesn't make a difference that it's doing drills on a weapon firing against someone else in, in a war zone it's it's getting up in the morning and making your bed it's funny isn't it and i don't say this to in any way to say it's a good experience or it's elite elite but you know there's there's kind of it all bonds us all those people that have heard those rounds coming in that crack you know it it's a it's a moment you are never going to forget your whole life. Well, until we get Alzheimer's or we take too much drugs, you never, you're never going to get that moment you heard. I remember it like yesterday, man. Take cover, take fucking cover. And you, and it, it, you can't even do it justice by trying to mimic it. It's, it's, it's there in that moment in that moment when you and that moment do you remember that moment in your mind where you go from like here you're just on patrol suddenly bang focus under yeah. fire it's a moment when you suddenly realize i'm under fire someone is shooting at me trying to kill me yeah it's uh god but mate we could talk for freaking hours on that just alone just alone gosh yes anyway let let's let's move forward did you let, let's talk casualties did you take any serious casual i mean you know, i don't know what the definition of serious is i'm guessing like losing a leg or, or getting maimed for life is is probably obviously one of them yeah, I mean, from our, from our, I think on our, I think four or five in general, I think we took 15, I think 15 lads died. 15 lads, unfortunately, completely lost their lives. What? Yeah. Um, 15? Yeah, so in a, from a unit, so I'll I've, I've say 700 guys, I think, it was something like 12 or 15, I'm, I'm sure. It was a bad, bad tour for, it was very, very tasty. Um, and then in our fob alone, off the top of my head, we had four, three, four. Danny, Danny, Tom. Three or four. Three, definitely four, maybe four. 
Um, this is, this and is, then other guys that got blown up and uh, yeah, ser- as in serious uh, in- so a serious injury is essentially if the, if the medical helicopter has to come in and take them out and they don't come back so we had a, 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 yeah, a dozen lads that did um, one of the guys Bish, absolutely top bloke awesome soldier, he lost but unfortunately lost both of his legs from the knee down um, absolutely funny story and he wouldn't mind me sharing it either um, just goes to show the sort of commando spirit and the humility and the ethos of him as a man and the way that he dealt with everything in, in general anyway. Um, steps on an IED, gets blown up, loses both his legs from the, from the knees down, both legs. And he comes with like, we're sort of stretching him out of there. We're carrying him out. And it wasn't too far from the fob. Like I said, our threat wasn't far away at all. So we had a, a, Kazi, a quick reaction force of guys come out to bring the to grab him on the stretcher because we were obviously fully laden, loads of gear, all the rest of it, hat knackered. And uh, one of the guys, Lee, comes running out and th- obviously doesn't realise that Bish is right there. And he comes running out. He's like, don't worry, lads, fresh legs, fresh legs, fresh legs. And Bish is laying there on the stretcher. Luckily, he had his morphine, so he was like in a world of his own. And he's just laying there and he's going, are you taking the piss? And he's laying there... L- legless pretty much and Lee's just like oh my god no 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 but like we're you're in a position where everything's going on around you Bish has lost his legs and he's still he's got a cigarette on because he's had his morphine and he's in his loving life and he's just literally can have that commando spirit to be like cheerfulness in the face of adversity as a poster of are you taking the piss I've just lost my legs um, Did your uh, troop stripey say, right, fellas, hands up, who's got two legs? Bish, what's your hand up for? <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing was, when he got his prosthetics, he asked them if they could make him six inches taller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better for trapping. <laughs> yeah, man. My top, God. Really top, bloke. top bloke. Yes, it, it, it's, that, it's that payoff, isn't it? You want. You want the excitement and, and the this and the that. You, you, you know, you, you go into that warfare, you got to be prepared that like some of you ain't coming back. And I mean, I, 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 it was never, I, I can only talk about me, obviously. It was never an issue for me. I didn't care. People always say, oh, if a soldier says they're not scared in combat, they're not. I never was scared ever in 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 northern ireland and, and and for people listening just to frame it we had what after the 70s which was chaotic in northern ireland it was just you know we're talking bloody sunday all these inquiries that have gone on since all these the bombs going off all that kind of thing well we were there in uh, in in the 80s and we had a particularly hectic tour it was just the way it was um but here's the thing, I was never scared. Even on our last patrol, when they got us in the briefing room and they said, guys, IRA are out to do all they can to kill a Marine. And we, we knew that all we we knew that all along. We knew, I mean, that's this is a game you're playing, right? They said there's semtex. Think of it like this: there's semtex in every lamppost. And I remember feeling like trepidation just a feeling of trepid like okay all right well i'll walk down the middle of the road then and that's what i did our last patrol i just walked down the middle of the um, i didn't go near the lampposts but i'll tell you what i was never scared not even even when we came under fire which we did at least twice to my memory i've never scared i was just up for the game because that's what it is when you're that age it's just a game you know, it, it, obviously, for, me, obviously. for me, it was sort of uh, an almost like a, a self. I don't really know how to frame it, but the the sort of best way I can describe it as is on the plane out to Afghanistan. In my own head, I was like, because before you before we went, you had to write. I'm like 18 years old. I'm writing a will. I'm like writing a letter to to go to my mum and dad on like if I pass away. And I remember writing it, going, 
thinking, this is mental. But then also in the same regard, I was so prepared and well-trained that I was like, it wasn't the fact that it was like, I am bulletproof or I am indispensable. To me, it was like an acceptance. It was like, okay, I'm going out to do exactly what it is that I'm trained for. And I think if you ha if I had any sort of hesitation or things going on at home or blah, 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 that would have just, that would have blurred my vision. Whereas, and it sounds terrible really, and it's not like a big time thing. I'm not saying, oh, I'm this, that, and the other. But I'd accepted that if I die, I die, essentially. Um, and for me, having that level of self-acceptance or self-awareness to be like, okay, I may die with this, but not that I'm happy with that, but I understand that and have that awareness of I'm going somewhere where I may not come back. Okay. I'm going to do everything in my power to make it sure that it's, that I do come back and that I don't whatever. But I think having that level of self-acceptance, exactly the thing, it was like, there was not one point that I was, I would say I was scared. There were times where I was like, shit, shit's real. Like that first time and stuff. But again, the, all the stuff in the Marines, had, had, all my training had led me up to facing fear and harnessing in it and, and being able to face it and go, it, there's, there's a difference for me. It's like, there's not, I'm not, I'm never really scared. I just, my body just prepares me and gets me ready for something. If I'm going to jump out of an airplane, if I'm going to climb a mountain, if I'm going to do whatever public speaking, something as simple as that, I look at that as, oh, my palms are sweaty. My stomach's a little bit, oh, like I feel a bit sick. That is my body going, we're getting ready. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. Like that is the way that I look at it. And if you frame it in that way, you don't crumble. You, you, you push forward. And it's, for me, it's the best way. Yeah. Accepting being able to accept. And it was like a hard thing, like being 18, 19 years old, being able to accept the fact that you might die. Like, and no one taught me that. That was something I just went through on my own. I was just on the, I remember being on the plane and I was just like, I might not come back. Okay. I've had a good life up to now. This is it. Let's go. And like, yeah, that might sound a little bit extreme, but that to me was, I was there doing the job exactly how it needed to be done. Yeah, I made mistakes and did other things and, and everyone does it. You can't be on top of your game every single time, especially when you're under such constant pressure all the time. But I came home, all my limbs, everything's fine. And I put that down to a testament of the way that I structured things in my own mind to be able to be like, okay, I know why I'm here. I'm accepted why I'm here. And if I don't come home, I accept that as well. So let's get on with the job at hand and let's get it done. Let's move on to your fascinating career. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke here. I'm, I, I hope our viewers find this as interesting as I do, Jack, because you are literally the bodyguard, like Kevin Costner to Whitney Houston. That, that, is, <laughs> that is your job. And uh, along with, I'm, I should hasten to add, being a, being a life coach or, or um, you know, promoting the commando mindset, but, but also part of your bread and butter is protecting celebrities um wow <laughs> <laughs> wow i'm not yeah. saying wow for the celebrity well maybe i am i i'm just saying wow for bloody being in that arena that 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 it, it, there's just again it's one of those things i could talk to you about for hours um and I'm so, so happy that I get a chance just to, to hear like your story and what it's like and, you know, what these celebrities are like and what are the dangers. And, oh, as you can see, mate, I, I, I've got a million questions, but I'll let you speak. I mean, yeah. So I suppose from, from a realistic and real life perspective, it, when people hear that that's what I do for a living, it's, 
it's so far away from normality for most people. They're just like, oh my God, they're exactly the same. They, they don't really know what to ask because it's like, well, what about this and what about that? And like, at the end of the day, celebrities, royalty, whoever it is, the one thing I've learned is they're no different from me and you. You had Robbie on your podcast or, or was coming up on the podcast that you chatted to. They're, they're no different. They're just human beings. They're just a bit more popular than other people. They just mm. have affected people's lives in a different way and they just have a, a bigger following. But most of these people, once you're sort of down to earth and, and nice and, and humanely sort of treat them with respect and all the rest of it and don't sort of just pander to them and oh my god oh my god oh my god they sort of they're, they're just humans and it's like i've never really been one to sort of put people on a pedestal and i think that stood me in good stead for what i do because no one really shocks me and i'm never like oh my god that's blah blah, blah or whoever but it's just treating people rather than putting them on a pedestal can I just say, Jack, for the record, like I'm not gushing over the celeb thing because Rob's my mate and he's he's just he's a lovely man. He, he's added oh. so much to my life that I've just through his sheer kindness in the short time that I've I've known him. It's it's that I'm fascinated with the fact of the job that you do, you know, mm -hmm. being in this high profile extreme what what could be what well, what what is an extreme stress environment and obviously you you deal with that in your own way putting the plans in action to protect these people against very real threats yeah absolutely i mean i have to think i even have to when people ask me for my for my email address i'm like mm, okay right you know what 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 could this lead to okay you know my, my email address is out there if you want to get hold of me but you know you don't know who's going to rock up on your doorstep and and i'm just a i'm, I'm a nothing but these guys are multi to the most they're the most well known i mean let's not use the word celebrity they're just the most well known people on the planet and your yeah. job is to be that very thin line between their safety and the 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 masses and of course in those masses is there's very m the, by far the majority are lovely lovely people there's but there's obsessive people there's crazy fans there's mentally unwell people there's people out to prove something and there's lots of people in the usa who've got guns right and and that that's where my fascination comes in yeah and it's it's sort of and exactly that it's 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 a very i love it it's very interesting in terms of no days ever the same and you you're exactly right it's that it's i'm there to be i'm there for both their safety but also their sort of almost guidance as well in the same way but then also i'm not there to be in the spotlight so you're sort of heard not seen the other way around um but i'm not there to to to, to poop the party essentially to to say oh you can't do this you can't do that some of these people are have have millions and upon millions of fans and supporters and all the rest of it so they have to go out in public and they have to do things and they have to sign autographs and all the rest of it what my job is is to mitigate do that in the safest and most best way possible to 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 have that interaction with the general public and those like minority nutters but because they need to do that they need to sign the autographs they need to show face they need to promote themselves but at the same time, they can't do everything. So it's my job to look after their well-being, their safety, and their security. And that's essentially exactly what it is. And, and it's it's very, very, <clears throat> it's very, very physically demanding. It's very, very mentally demanding. And it's very, very the planning that goes into it, people just have no idea or concept of how to conceive how what even goes behind it. Like even the celebrities, some of the celebrities themselves, when they're like, I'll, I'll sort of talk to them about stuff and they're like, oh, I didn't even think about that. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's not your job. It's my job. But 
just so you know, there's this in place, there's that in place. We've done this. I've sorted this out. We're going to go this route in. We're using the back door this time instead of the front. It, a multitude of a, an array of different things. Um, but ultimately, uh, and you're sort of one mistake away from never working again, That's essentially. It's such a high-pressure job. Um, you could have a 20-year career of absolutely gleaming, working with everybody under the, under the sun. Make one mistake and you could never work again. I'm just going to put some context here is the, the celebrities we're talking about, they, they've lived a, a very confusing life from many perspectives. You know, they have a skill, they're not, they're either, they either have something natural, they've worked at it from a really young age. They've been thrust into the public sphere by basically people that just want to make a lot of money them. And I'm not saying they don't want to, you know, have that celebrity, but the world that's created around them, they have people pandering to them. Oh yes, sir. Right. What do I do next? Oh, oh, you look fine. So, oh, that person, they live in a very false world, but I can tell you something. They love their bodyguards. You know, they look at their Marines their paras, their SBS, their S SAS, these guys that just come and go, all right, mate, right, what we need to do is this, 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 do that. And they're like, hang on, this person's like treating me normally. They don't really give a fuck that, you know, well, well why? Well, because we've led extreme lives already. We, 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 we get it, you know, we get it. We, we, we've seen... We've seen people in extreme action that celebrity never anyone in to do with like say Hollywood is never going to see. What, hmm. what we've done is up there, and these guys are just playing a game, a silly, silly. I, I use that word in 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 context. You know, a kind of it's it's TV. It's people on TV making TV program. It's it's not like putting your life alongside when your body's bleeding, your body's bleeding to death in Afghanistan, you know, that, that's, that's serious shit. This is, this is, you know, serious, but it's, it's, it's a kind of, I don't know, lower level. I, I hope people get what I'm trying to say, but my point is I know because I speak to some of these celebrities that they love their bloody bodyguards because their body got there's, 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 a, there's a mutual respect there essentially it's and, and i'm always um open and honest with anyone but essentially i'm the authority there it's they have to it, it's a point of they may ignore other people but that i me as a personal i'm there to be seen and not heard really unless i need to get a point across so i won't be sitting there making idle chit chat with these people if i don't need to if they include me in a conversation i will talk but otherwise i'll be quiet i'll get on they can do what they need to do and if i have something that i have to say that they know that they will sit and listen and understand and take on board what i'm about to tell them because ultimately if they don't listen to what i've got to say which is where things can slip down and 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 and, and dangers and hazards may end up presenting themselves needlessly really because as long as i do my job properly we can go out do what we need to do and come back with with no sort of unscathed really which is ultimately what we plan to do great example there is um the lady die princess die i don't i don't know what she was called at the end to be honest but when she was with dodi al fired and the bodyguard got in a vehicle and said, right, put your seatbelts on, you know, basic common sense. Well, no, we're, I'm royalty or I'm ex royalty. I'm, I'm the richest, one of the richest men in the world. We don't put our seat. Well, we saw what happened, right? You know, they ignored the bodyguards advice and this, and this is the balances is that you guys must have to deal with just not, not, it's not like a one-off thing that happens once a week. It's all, every single decision is you against this person that in their mind, they're, they're the biggest bollocks in the world. They're, they're, they're the most important person in their life. And, and, and the way celebrities set up is they probably think they're the most important in everybody else's life. Your job is like, actually, sir, you're, or madam, you know, you're, 
your security is my my concern and you need to do this and then you're battling that that self-importance right yeah i mean th there are occasions but majority of the time people are good and they listen to what you have to say usually there's the odd time where they won't do that sort of stuff but you just sort of pleasantly persistent i'd just be like um seatbelt or put your seatbelt on uh, oh just can you put your seatbelt on please like you you just there's ways and means of which it's it's not just a case of standing there and being the bodyguard and being all hard it, it's having those soft skills to be able to explain talk to people build rapport have mutual respect um so that people actually listen to what you've got to say and follow your instructions of what you got to do essentially hmm. say for example like i was bodyguarding kim wilde right and i said kim i suggest for your security in this situation you like just give me a really big kiss like a massive maybe chuck in a hug like would she have to do that <laughs> no absolutely not damn it i'm glad <laughs> i'm glad i never became a bodyguard <laughs> Half our audience like, who the fuck is Kim Wilde? No, no disrespect, Kim. You will always be my my, my baby. <laughs> we are the kids in America. Uh huh. So no, it's, come on, let, let's it's obviously professional lines and boundaries that you have to stick to as well. So hey, I bet you, don't I, you end up in these situations, but it's I bet you're in a you're compromise, so mate. I bet it it it. I'm not saying this is like a general thing or, or it should be promoted, What? but I bet a few people are, I mean, well, bodyguards have come out, have they not, and said that this celebrity put me under pressure to like sleep with them and this kind of thing. Yeah, for sure, it, like, it does happen. But if you're unfortunate to be put in a situation like that, you're in a lose-lose situation. Because if you, whichever way, whichever route you take, if you say no, you're going to upset them. So they're probably going to sack you. If you say yes, you're not going to get married and live happily ever after. And it's never going to end in a fairy tale. So eventually somewhere down the line, they're going to end up falling out with you or whatever. And you're going to end up losing your job or you're going to do it. And then someone's going to end up blackmailing someone along the line. Someone's going to find out and whatever. It's, it's an absolute car crash waiting to happen. So You've got to try and keep that professional boundary that it doesn't get that way. But it, it like does, people become fond and, and you, you spend a lot of time in close proximity with each other. So there, there's definitely things that happen, but it's, it, it's a way of trying to keep it as professional as you can all of the time so that you can mitigate those types of things it, it, it rings bells doesn't it with that situation where you get a, a prisoner we get a female female like prison warder and you get the guy that's carries the 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 convict that's charismatic and do you know what i mean it's just it, it's, it's absolutely yeah absolutely you have to be so gosh yes you have to be so boundary don't you in that job and Absolutely, which is why I think it's absolutely pertinent to be that seen, not heard figure and speak when you need to, rather than there's a there's a fine line between building rapport and getting too friendly. And I think as long as you can walk that line well, you'll always maintain a professional relationship. Once you start stepping into that um, friend zone, which is when feelings can start coming into it, as long as you keep it as professional as you can, then that's the best way I've, I've found to keep you on a, a level playing field per se. Jack, I guess we need to talk here and I'm fascinated, but who have you bodyguarded and, and, and you know, what, how, how has it been with them? <laughs> um, well, I've done numerous different um, royal families from the Middle East, Dubai, Saudi, um, Brunei, um, numerous different sort of wider royal family fam family trees per se. Um, so a lot of Arabic families and and um, people from the Middle East and stuff like that, which is one side of the coin. Um, I've done corporate, so businessmen, um, high-ranking CEOs, 
um, the likes of Tim Cook, who owns Apple, um, Steve Jobs' predecessor, looked after him. Very, very interesting man he is. Um, very, you want to talk about a successful driven man, gets up at like 4 a.m. every day. Um, insane. Um, so talking people like that. Um, and then on the celebrity side of stuff, um, to throw a few names in the hat, uh, um, may he rest in peace, God rest his soul, Kobe Bryant, who was an absolute gem of a man. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of um, the team when he came to the UK to do some stuff in London. Um, and we facilitated that, which was, he was just a complete, everything that is seen about him is absolutely true. He's an absolute gentleman, absolute monster. He's huge. Um, his hands, you shake his hands and his fingers are like here. It's just incredible. Um, but yeah, absolutely great guy. Um, I've looked after um, Paris Hilton, Katy Perry, Elton John, um, as a few sort of different celebrities I'm, I'm Kim, working Kim, at the moment. Kim Wilde? Kim, Kim Wilde? No, unfortunately, unfortunately not, mate. We, we, our paths haven't crossed. Um, yeah, I'll just check in. It, and if, if you happen to get a phone number, just, you know, if you want to email it to me, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind, mate. I'll keep you in mind. I may, uh, if, if, we, if I cross paths, I may, may whisper to Chris Thrall in their ear and see what's interesting. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, 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 I should just give a shout out to my wonderful girlfriend, Jenny, who's just uh, the best person I ever could have met on this planet. We are joking, of course, but oh, cool, boot, boot neck humour. <laughs> um, but yeah, just to sort of, yeah, let's, let's throw in a few names in there. One of the guys I'm working with at the moment, um, young British actor, Tom Holland, who's the, the lad who plays Spider-Man. Um, great guy. We, we have a great working relationship. Um, we were actually away working when just before the lockdown happened. So yeah, it'd be good to get back to things and got busy, busy schedule coming up for the rest of, well, won't be the rest of this year, it'll be next year now um, with all sorts happening and stuff. So yeah, it's um, lots, lots going on. Really, lots of lots of interesting people to meet. Sometimes I find myself um, in situations and places where I'm like, sort of have to pinch myself and like, oh, actually, um, I'd never end up in a in a place like this. Um, have it had it not been for me deciding to join the Royal Marines, essentially all those years back. What, what about? Um, do you have to what? Are they like, right, I'm just going off to the bathroom to snort some coke or, 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 or have you been in those sort of situations? Um, not specifically like that. Um, there's definitely been times where I've been asked to bend rules and stuff like that, which is fine. It's, it's something, my job is not to police what they're doing. My job is to make sure they, whatever they are doing, they're doing in a safe and, and sort of welfare perspective. Because essentially... I meant more like, is it something massive that goes on in certain... I mean, I'm guessing it does, but is, it, is that part of the job is to, oh, right, they're going to do that now, okay. Yeah, of course. It's, it's not my place to turn around and say, you shouldn't be doing that. Whatever they want to do, like I said before, it, it's my job to facilitate the best and safest way for them to do whatever there is that they're doing. So not that I'm condoning anything and I'm going collecting drugs for anybody by any means at all. That is not what I'm saying. Please do not take those words and put them into my mouth. But there are ways and means which, yes, yeah, sometimes things happen outside of the norm or whatever off, off, of, off camera. But that's not my job. My job is to maintain their public image. So if, say, if that is something that they do want to participate in, my job is to make sure that no one sees that that's what they're doing. Hmm. So as much as I don't condone it, if it's going on under my watch, then it's my way to control it as best I can and do a, maintain a professional image for them for what they're doing. Because sometimes some of these people are the pressure that they're under because of the fans on them all the time, sometimes they, I'm not saying they need to, but sometimes they take the steam off. It, it, it happens. Like these sorts of things do happen. Wow. So we're all human, aren't we? You know, then, exactly. and I'm, I'm not different. Who am I to judge anyone and, and preach to anyone on what they should and shouldn't do with their life? 
Um, some of these people, if they need to have a drink or they have a smoke, then that's that's what they do. That's what they enjoy to do. That takes the edge off. It keeps them them. And uh, for me, it's just a case of maintaining their sort of social profile in terms of their welfare on people not seeing what they're getting up to. Like what, what anybody does in the privacy of their own home or in their own sort of surroundings is, is entirely up to them. So again, it, it comes down to that holding, withholding that professional image on just getting the job done, being seen and not heard until you need to be. And, Have and you, just, um, so I, I'm going to guess here because I, obviously I know a lot of bodyguards. I've, ex-marine you you just know a lot of guys that do the the circuit as they call it yeah um one thing you hear is a lot of it's quite mundane you know it's what watching the kids by the swimming pool and this kind of stuff and i i guess there's a fine line there between doing your job and someone taking a piss out of you right you know absolutely when, absolutely when it's like, right can you put this letter in the mailbox for me it, you know in in, in the post yeah, okay, I'll do that once, I'll do it twice. By the time you, that's what you're asking me to do all the time is that's not my freaking job and that's not what I paid thousands of pounds to train for and go for a, a career in the Marines and be in Afghanistan. Um, but it, ha have you, it, it's that thing, isn't it, where the, the, the chances of, of, of something happening are probably really slim. I, I mean, obviously more so for a celebrity, but what I mean is... Yeah, it's quite dependent and situation dependent, but yeah, 90% of the time is the day to, the mundane day-to-day -day essentially doubling up as a bit of a PA. This is what we're doing today, here's your itinerary, blah, 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 this is what's what, blah, 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 blah. The planning that goes into it is a lot more, there's more to it than that in terms of routes and entrances exits linking up liaisons and all the rest of that type of stuff um but yeah the the sort of the bog standard day-to-day -day running of a bodyguard is making sure the day goes successfully basically and getting them from a to b safely securely and and without any mishaps on time because most of the time the the celebrity well any high net worth individual because they have so many people that work for them not that they don't want to or, or, or do understand. Half the time they're being pulled from pillar to post, so they never know where they are anyway. So they're just like, what's next? Like, where are we going next? What's the score? They don't know who they're meeting, where they're going, what the direction is, what the route is. So as long as, for me, it just takes another job off of their shoulders. Um, if they've got a PA, it takes some, helps them out with what they're doing. And again, it, it all builds up to this sort of, all-rounded professional image of oh well we can we can we don't need to worry about certain aspects because we know jack's going to have that covered what we can deal with is this that and the other and obviously you, if you when you come in as a new person to a new client sometimes you're not really trusted again you have to earn your, it's like the whole cat badge you have to you have to earn your sort of stripes in terms of the trust you have to build the trust of the people which it's not so much it's more so to do with those soft skills and the and the day to day and the, your approach and the way that you deal with things in terms of people becoming to trust you to be like no you know we can rely on Jack we we, we know he's going to get the job done we know he's going to get us there safely we don't need to worry about where we're going we've got a good driver all the all these things that so most people will just be like ah oh, didn't think of that. <laughs> My job is full of things that people don't think about. That's what it essentially is. Um, that what well, Billy Billy said that didn't he? Billy Billingham. The, the, for people who don't know, who Billy is he's a, he's one of the hosts on the SAS Who Dares Wins program, and he said one celebrity said to him one time, like, "What do you do?" Meaning, like, is he like black belt in taekwondo? Is he you know some ninja sniper? What? And it, and he said. I think <laughs> yeah. exactly. and, it's, and that's in essence that's what it all comes down to and it's and it's, it's so it's such a as soon as you explain to people what you actually do straight away they go oh so like you must be really hard then or you've got a black belt in this or this that and the other or you must be like and it's like well 
I don't have any black belts, but yes, I'm very highly trained in, in a numerous different sort of self-defense and martial arts and all the rest of that type of stuff. But if I'm having a fight with someone, where's my client? The, 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 the ultimate goal for me is the safety, well-being and, and security of my client. So as soon as something kicks off, I'm not dealing with the threat. I said, go, take it back to Afghanistan. That was exactly what I was doing. The threat kicked off and I was like, where is it? It's over there. I'm going straight for it. Whereas with this, it's a, it's a, step, a, step, it's a take a step back moment. It's a what's going on. The client's my first priority. Get them in the car and get out of there or get them on foot and get out of there, whatever the way is. Mm -hmm. um, but again, people are like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. But again, it's Billy's absolutely spot on. It's, it's all about thinking. It's, it's much more mentally exhausting than it is physically exhausting. Yes, you spend a lot of time on your feet all day and it is long days, depending on who your client is, but it's, it's a lot more mentally. Does it, does it pay well? I, I mean, I, I'm guessing it probably pays more than, um, you know, shelf. It pays more than when I was in the Marines, let's say that. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, more than, more than I earn or stacking shelves in a supermarket, not, no, no yeah, disrespect not too, like, it, at it, all. I'm a self-employed subcontractor, so I freelance essentially. Um, so yeah, as a as a daily rate, it's it's good it's good pay. But then, unless you have a, a full-time client and you're someone's full-time personal protection, then you end up with times where jobs finish and then jobs start and gaps and all the rest of that. So the money eats itself out. So you're never going to be. I mean, if you worked, 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 you'd earn a good, a really good living out of it, but then you'd have no life. So it's, it's a balance because essentially for you to do your job successfully and, and sort of professionally, you have to, you, you're there full 24 seven, because if you go home or take the weekend off, what's your client doing? So again, it's, if you want to earn lots and lots of money at it, You've got to work, 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 and live the life of the client that you're looking after. So it's trying to balance it correctly. Um, which, if you if you find the right client, then and and they're doing something that's that's interesting and, and cool and something you are linked with and you enjoy, blah blah blah, then then you can find yourself in a in a good sort of happy balance between the work and because you're not really going to have much time off, but there's like the saying, if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. So how to do that from a, a bodyguard perspective, because like, even though you, you are absolutely working, there's no like, oh, it doesn't feel like work because you still are working. And relevant of your relationship with the client and what they're doing, mm. you still are having to work and put a lot of energy and effort into the planning and the processes and, and all the rest of that facilitation management and all the rest of it's really funny because i'm just going to give a shout out here to all the support workers around the world you know particularly because i've done support work. i've looked after lots of people with learning disability oh, and it's, yeah. it's the parallels between what you're saying and what i've had to do protect the you know you don't you don't like shelter them from reality that that would be wrong but you've got to be that kind of that that there's a word in it I, I i'm not clever enough to think about it but that 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 thing that goes in the middle between them and react because people are you know everything's about social interaction isn't it and 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 and, and sometimes you're kind of that Oh, I wish I was better at English. Getting this to that without creating a problem is what I'm trying to say. And in learning disability, it's a big thing, you know, because you're, you might have a client that will just come out and say something randomly, which to you it's fine because you know them and, you know, it doesn't. But when you're in a supermarket yeah, and that guy there is doesn't know anything about people with learning disability, they're like, huh? Yeah, yeah, of course. Did I just say to me, did, did, you, did you, did you just, and, and you're like, and yeah, yeah, funny, Inter that's interesting. Thing. And I, on a similar level, it's like if you're with a client who's not necessarily that much security aware, 
and they want to post something to their social media, for instance, but you're somewhere where people don't know where you are and you don't want people, you don't want a crowd outside the hotel and you're in France, for instance, and they want to take a picture at the, Par at the Eiffel Tower, you don't, you're like, we're trying to be doing something under the radar here. You shouldn't be here or we don't want people to know you're here. So don't, so there's a little bit of guidance and sort of caring to, it's not the right word to use in this aspect, but guidance is definitely alongside what, what part of my job spec is, is just making people aware of, mm, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. But again, it's just getting to that point. If you just start saying, Oh, I wouldn't advise doing that. Sometimes people will be like, well, who are you? Like, you're not here to tell me what to do. You need to build that level of trust and rapport to be able to stand there and say, would you mind taking a picture the other way around so you don't see that monument in the back so that people won't see what we're doing? Oh, yeah, good idea. <laughs> I, have you had this situation? I, I had a, a certain celebrity I was chatting to the other day, and no, it's, it, it wasn't Robbie, um, and they let slip without even kind of thinking about it that that they got their security or whatever to sign the the autographs um you know and, and obviously when you're in the business of of when you're in the business of media or art or what what whatever that is when it gels together you don't have time to sign 1000 things for fans you you just literally there is no time in your day and i'm not saying me because obviously that doesn't you know i i send a, a i get asked for a few things a day and that that's that's manageable but if i was getting asked for hundreds of signatures a day yeah and i had a, a bodyguard i'll be like mate this is my sign, sign some of those for <laughs> and, and who's ever gonna know right yeah, of course. And the reason I'm laughing is somebody heard this celebrity say it in my podcast. So they went, what? He doesn't sign his own. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, come on, come on. Is Dude, that something to put there? Yeah. Have you, have you come across that sort of thing or is it? Um, I haven't been asked to, to sign anything personally. I've heard of other people um, that it's happened to, but also again, I sort of in that situation, I try and, again, sort of people skills and communication, I sometimes go out to the crowds beforehand or if we're somewhere filming something and crowds are there all day, if we've got a little bit of time, I would go out and be like, look, to, the, to whoever the client is, look, we've, we've got some downtime here. It would be good for you to sign some autographs, but we don't really want to go out there because it will just go chaos. How about I go out, grab a handful of different autograph things, bring them back here to the safe environment, them to sign them away, 10, 15 minutes of doing that, and then me take them back out. They go, what a brilliant idea. You go up to the crowd. The crowd think that you're amazing because you're doing them a favor and blah, blah, blah. It's all a case of just working everything and, and just sort of doing it to the best you can. So little tips and tricks like that will help you along the way. Don't get me wrong, there's there's not many times where you have pockets of time where there's not much happening, but little things like that I've done absolutely loads of times. And it and it and it it makes massive differences because then once you go out, I can then talk to the crowd and say, look, we're gonna be coming out at like five o'clock. We'll take some pictures. Please stay where you are. There's a barrier there, don't cross it. We're gonna be on the other side of the road. Whoever the celebrity is will stop and wave so you can take some pictures. We won't be doing personal pictures, but you can get a picture. We'll, we'll make sure you get a picture and then we'll be off. Cool. They know where they stand. They know I've got time to aim for, blah, blah, blah. And that took me all of five minutes to go out and do that. Um, but it's that going that little bit extra mile to, to try and make my life. Because if we go out and they run the barrier then I'm, I'm in a completely different situation and now I'm in a hostile environment that I've got to try and sort and look after my client. So if I can mitigate certain things like that, the same with paparazzi. People have a massive thing about against paparazzi and yeah, they can be absolute demons sometimes. But again, if, you, if I ever get a chance and I, I'm with them, I talk to them and I'll say, look, 
don't worry, you'll get your picture. Please don't fight against me because that's not what we're here for. Don't want to have a battle. We are going this way. For your best picture, work out where you need to be. We need to do this, this, this first. Let us do that. Let me get them over there, and then you can have a picture. Nine times out of ten, they'll go, oh, oh, okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. What time are you coming out? Just little bits of information and just make your life a, a damn sight easier. It, it's little tips like that. But to answer your question, no, I haven't forged any signatures for any clients that I've worked for. Jack, just my, my, my last um, point to you, and please don't compromise your security or, 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 or any celebrity security, but I'm just interested to know about arms, you know, carrying a pistol is, is obviously there's in the UK, the very tight laws on, on firearms. And I know the U S is, is, I don't know if relaxed is the right expression, but they have different laws there. Yeah, it's it's very, very different. Yeah. Um, so no, in the UK, there's absolutely no way really. Um, it's not worth your own livelihood because if you if someone asked you to and you got caught, you would 100% go to go to court and potentially go to prison for it. So it's not worth it. And to be perfectly honest, it, from my personal experience and my knowledge, there's no need that you don't need to be armed in the UK. Absolutely not. Um, yes, there's some pretty horrible people around, and yes, there may be people with some sort of arms with them, but I'm armed with the knowledge and the experience of enough to be able to get a client out of danger without needing any sort of weapons or anything like that. Like I said, it's, it's a different ball game from going to war and having a weapon and shooting it back than it is in an executive or normal day celebrity type style life. That it's more, it's a, it's a brain thing rather than a brawn thing. My planning and processes and direction and all the rest of that escape routes, secondary routes, all that is what goes into play instead of loading a pistol. Um, in the UK, I've got some friends in like the Met Police and some other places like that, the armed response officers that do close protection, they can be armed, but they are allowed to be armed. Um, it's always concealed, but they're allowed to. At the end of the day, I haven't got any right to carry any sort of arms with me. It's just not worth me going to prison if if for whatever reason someone paid me a million pounds to do a job and wanted me to carry a pistol and i something happened and i shot someone i would want ultimately go to court and go to prison because i shot someone I, just because i do what i do does not give me any precedence over anybody else so the answer to that is no in the uk in the states yes there are ways and means of doing it it all depends on circumstance client where you're going, what you're up to. But yes, that is something that can happen. Um, and then other countries, for instance, the Middle East, um, Africa, those types of places. I've not been, but if I did go, I would probably want to be armed because if you're fighting against someone that has a weapon, I would, as, as long as I'm legally able to, give me one, I'll, I'll happily take one for sure. Because as much as I harp on about it's not a case of having a fight, if we're stuck somewhere like that, then the rules are a little bit different. Walking around London or going to shows and doing arenas or uh, movie sets and things like that, absolutely no requirement. It's more of a scaremonger tactic than anything else, I would say. Whereas if you're in the jungle in somewhere in the Congo or out in the middle of Kazakhstan, walking around the desert or in a, in a bazaar in Kandahar or somewhere like that, then I would definitely... If I was given the opportunity, I would have a weapon for sure because yeah, different just, places, different rules, you know, different rules. But right. again, that is that is having that adaptability to be able to a, a good a good close protection operator is 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 a, is a comedian. It's able to put a suit on. It's able to go to a red carpet. It's able to do a, an Oscars show. It's able to blend in day to day. It's able to take the kids swimming. It's able to go to the desert if you need to, put body armour and a gun on and be able to do your thing. It, it's all that wide range of different things, you know. Um, and just blend it in, getting in, not highlighting the fact, gone are the days of the massive seven-foot, humongous, massive, great big bodyguard because they just attract attention. Before they even know who the celebrity is, they're like, Jesus, who's that bloke? 
Oh my God, look at the size of hey, it. Hey, that, that is why I'm not going to go for that job, mate, you know? What? I mean, you can look. Just, just stay away, because it's just ridiculous. Look, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, that's you guys, okay? <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's a case of, of blending in, staying normal and, and thinking on your feet. And it's, He's absolutely right. Billy's absolutely hit the nail on the head. It, it's you're a think, you're a thinker. That's it. What, what's your skill? Thinking. That's it. Forward thinking. Forward planning. Every eventuality, try and cover it. For hopefully none of them to actually have, have to happen. That's essentially what it is. What it boils down to. Jack, I, as with with many of my guests, I I would love to chat to you for another four hours there's a million things we haven't covered uh, you said red carpets my god there's i've just got a million questions about <laughs> walking the red carpet with a celebrity um i'm conscious of the time we are going to cover that next time yeah for sure. um what i do uh, for anyone that wants to get hold of jack i'm going to put your links in the description yeah, just one. Well, just one on that. I just wanted to make just make people aware of what I'm actually doing at the moment. This month, I'm actually running a challenge this month um, called the Calendar Club Challenge, and obviously, it's nothing like Chris has done, which is run the length of the UK. So, hats off to you on that one, mate. That was uh, definitely one for the books. Um, I'm not taking my out, of mate. I got, I got, I got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, so the Calendar Club. Um, challenge is essentially running the um, corresponding date, running the corresponding amount of kilometers to the date of the month. So each day, and it rises up. So that on the first, I ran 1k, the second, I ran 2k, today, I ran 6k, tomorrow, I'm going to run seven, and so on. So it goes up all the way up to 30k. So it's a total of 496 kilometers throughout the month. Um, and it's just, I'm just trying to, I'm not doing it for charity. There's every Tom, Dick and Harry at the moment are doing stuff for charity, which is great. Um, but I'm just, I, I don't want to be another person to say, put your hand in your pocket for this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. So for me, it's just a case of trying to make people aware. Exercise is such a fundamental part of my life. And I know that it makes is a it makes me tick it, it, it's, it's amazing i think it's i'm reading a book at the minute that that compares exercise to medicine in mental health and brain neurology and all the rest of that type of stuff and i fully believe that and i genuinely at a time where people are stuck at home i just want to inspire people to try and move their body and get out and yes we're locked in your house but you're allowed out for an hour move your body and it will ultimately help your mind help your your whole state really because it's just an amazing thing to do so if i can run nearly 500 kilometers in a month get out and and take a walk around the park or do a little workout at home or watch joe wicks's pe or stuff like that so yeah if anyone's i'm documenting on, on my instagram so just come along and follow along it'd be great to try and spread the word and try and reach as many people as i can to just inspire them to just move their body and stay healthy and and Keep, keep your mind active really at a time where there's not much going on at all just to try and I'm doing it to challenge myself because it's I haven't done something like this for a while so it'd be good for, for a personal perspective it'll be good for me to challenge my mind and, and train my mind back to how I used to sort of be putting it in 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 different situations and outside my comfort zone on a regular basis um, I just thought I haven't done something for a while so let's do this so yeah be uh if you want to come and have a look at me struggling through running 500 kilometers then feel free to follow along jack will put all your links below i was being a bit cagey there because i didn't know as a bodyguard what what you're allowed to what social media you're allowed you you want to talk about so so we'll put we'll put it it doesn't matter we'll put it all below the video whatever whatever you'd like yeah it's social media as a point for me is it's it is what it is i don't put stuff for work on there obviously for obvious obvious reasons but my own personal stuff is absolutely fine and especially something like that i really want to try and inspire as many people as i can with the challenge um so yeah please sort of feel free to share it and, and spread the word because if i can get 100 people out running that have never run before 
that that's that'd be amazing to me so the more people i can try and help and inspire the better and, and ultimately just try and help them through a bit of a tough patch if that's lockdown is is not you're not loving lockdown life you're sort of crawling the walls then if i can show you a few videos and a couple of posts each day that sort of put a smile on your face and be like oh actually do you know what yeah i do need to get some trainers or i do need to go and get some fresh air or walk the dog or whatever then it'll be, it'll be massively beneficial so. mate you'll certainly do that you will certainly do that you know it i i really haven't got my head around the fact because i'm like a self-contained unit i've done what i've done in my life just because i wanted to get certain results and i'm quite i'm not talking about ego here or anything like that i just mean like i'm like i i know my shit and what i want to do right when yeah. people write to you and go chris i've started running because of you yeah yeah of course i well i'll be honest what 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 i don't think about me in that in that scenario what i think is fucking good effort <laughs> you know exactly. fucking good effort well done mate you know well done and i don't think it's because of me i mean okay maybe seeing you doing a bit of running is yeah, a you've helped. So that's what it's all about it's, the challenge is ultimately for me it's a personal preference personal pride thing for me that i want to push myself on my mind to to get up each day and run those kilometers but in the in the sort of aftermath if that can someone watching that can go Oh, do you know what? Actually, I am a bit overweight. I should get out and run. If watching me ten days on the trot doing hanging out on my hoop really mm -hmm. is the mo the motivation for them to go, oh, if he can do it, I can definitely get out and run a mile or a kilometre. Then it's I've achieved my it, it, it's helped. Then it's a hey, how how can it be bad? <laughs> you know how exactly. how can it be bad? That's that's what we we're, we're saying. Jack, you're an absolute legend. I thoroughly enjoyed this talk. Yeah, me too. Seriously, mate. I, I just feel so privileged that you've allowed me into a, to, to a, a, a window on a life that, I'll be going to be honest, you don't really get a window on Hollywood celebrity bodyguards <laughs> when, you, when, when, when you, you know, in the southwest of England, <laughs> no, nothing wrong with the southwest of England, but you know, I love part of the world. I lived there for a few years. You've been so open. I, I know it's not the easiest of things to talk about as well because there's certain codes as a professional that that you, well, you and I have to follow, and 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 as as do our our our, our watchers. So, um, stay on the line, mate, because I, I just want to say um an, another big thank you after I've said goodbye, um. But yeah, I'm sure our subs, our friends at home, are going to have a lot more questions for you. And so please come back and answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that they've got, any talks that they want to have. Or, yeah, for sure. Like I said, all my sort of social and things will be there anyway. If you want to connect with me personally, then that's fine. I'm, I've got time for anybody, really, especially people that need some help that's if i can i'm not saying that i'm a saint or anything like that but if i can help in any way shape or form of anything that i've learned in my life then if i can pass it on for sure definitely. and if if you happen to see kim wilde just tell her i said hello i'll make a note of that right now <laughs> our friends at home massive love to you and your families be be safe be smiling please don't watch don't watch the media and see you next time. Hello friend, I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall, I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.